Thanks. Thanks. Hey, Nick, can you um send me the link to the Facebook page real quick in the chat? Yeah. Just put it in there. I want to put it on, uh, I'm going to live this thing on, on Facebook as well. All right. So, hey, welcome, everybody. Another Thursday night. And I'm sure people will be joining in here slowly. So I'm just going to take a couple seconds here to get my Facebook live going here. I forgot how slow my laptop is. Yeah, new one. Huh? <laughs> need a new one yeah all right one second guys bear with me <laughs> are you letting people in too yep all right cool just handle that for me thanks all right, cool. So, hey, welcome everybody. And um, as people are hopping in here, just kind of do a quick introduction. Um, you know, there's some new names in here that I haven't seen, and then lots of different kind of Zoom and, and and iPhones. So, oh, hey, brother, welcome. And this call has been around since um, uh, probably six or seven months now. And really the point and the purpose of this call is a segue that comes, you know, a little bit behind my, um, my Monday night calls. Monday night calls is very introductory in nature. There's usually a guest speaker. We're going to have Zasha from Hawaii join us on Monday night. But uh, this call is just for people that are a little bit more advanced. I want to take a little more serious and actually dive into how to do multifamily and commercial real estate. So this call contains everything from, you know, wherever you are right now to actually getting a deal closed. So it's not the operational side, it's nothing after closing a deal, but it's all the analysis and everything else that it takes to get to the closing, all right? So the, the high level, um, the high level, sequence in which deal is done is for somebody that is brand new you are looking to get started you don't know really to get started so you jump on a bunch of these types of zoom calls and see where you find the most value where do you gel with the person that is kind of facilitating these calls and uh, um you know i always say it's extremely important that wherever whatever mentorship or wherever you go into that the person that is leading it, you feel good with, right? You don't want to go into something being like, oh, I, I agree. I don't agree going in there like that. If you are open to somebody, your learning will be much, much faster and accelerated. So, um, you know, going into these types of Zooms, find your, find your tribe, find your team. That's what you should be doing, right? A lot of people go right into looking at deals and wonder why they can't get a deal done for six months, eight months, a whole year, two years, you know, and it gets frustrating. But multifamily, the first thing you got to understand is that this is a team game. Okay. And I love that it's a team game because it allows you to be creative. The bigger the deal, the more creative you can get. All these different ways of funding and financing a deal is just really cool when you understand all the different pieces of the puzzle and you're able to put it together um, to make a deal happen. So a lot of different deals, we've used different strategies, private money, um, private equity, preferred lending, um, regular, you know, agency deck, um, you know, traditional mortgages that we use and uh, seller financing. We've even done seller financing on some on some deals. So, you know, those are all different ways to get it going. But the first thing is to find your find your team, find the place where you're going to you know, you feel good to, to learn in this space, right? That you believe in the person that is going to lead you there. So that's the first, the first thing is, you know, calls like these. Now there's a lot of calls like these now. So how do you know which one to join? I don't know, join them all to start and just find, find the people that you click with. All right. So that's one. 
Um, two is you want to begin to determine where your market's going to be, All right? Like where, where, what market am I going to look at? I usually suggest people to begin by looking in your backyard. You know, Grant talks about underwrite the building that you're living in, underwrite the community that you live in. So, you know, just getting started on anything because it's for, it's really all for learning and practice, All right? So we want to get, we want to get those things, uh, you know, going. So using your backyard allows you to network with local people, meet investors in those areas, meet the brokers in those areas, and then beginning to you know, understand it and actually being able to physically be somewhere and see it and witness it, walk properties, all of those things. So that's, um, you know, that would be the second step. And then you want to, you want to begin to underwrite deals, know your criteria, know where you're at, what you're going to bring to the table. So part of that is underwriting a whole bunch of deals and seeing where your gap is. And then where can I fit in on a team? How do I get a team to do a deal with me? You want to find your strengths. And your strength is going to tie directly to something that you can do that you feel like you don't have to get paid for. So if you can do something in your mind that, hey, I can do this because I like it. It's exciting. I could be passionate about it. And if I don't get paid for, I'm still, I'm still kind of good. You know, I still can live with it for, you know, just grinding it out because that's what it's going to take, right? You're not going to be able to go into anything brand new and just think you're going to hit home runs right away. You want to find all the different stepping stones to that home run. What do you have to work on in order to get there? Um, and then you know, understanding debt, the debt market, understanding how cap rates work. So all of those things will kind of cover everything. And then really the steps is submitting an LOI and, you know, the, the seller is going to take like two, three days, whatever, get back to you. And you guys will negotiate the terms on the LOI. Some of the terms that you will, um, the terms that you you will put on there is how long is the contract going to be? How long is the due diligence first? So that's the period in which you kind of like study the property. So I'll tell you one deal that we're looking at also right now. It's um there's a there's a deal that we're looking at. It's forty million dollars in a hotel, and we can't even see the financials until we get the deal under contract. So normally people are like, what? That's a weird process, right? But remember, all things could be an opportunity. So if we only focus on like, oh, well, nobody does it this way. That means you're, there's going to be so many people that's learned. No, we need the financials first before we submit an offer, get it under contract. Cool. That means all those people will not be in this deal. So you get it under contract and then figure out how it goes, because really all that it means is we're going to have 60 day due diligence on the on the project. So we'll get the financials. We'll look through everything in that time frame. And we got 60 days to pull out of it. But at least we control the deal. I think this is something that people are missing in uh, in terms of, you know, getting started early is controlling the deal. Grant talks about control the deal first. And people are like, what does that mean? It means you lock it down, get it under contract. You have a period of time in which you can pull your money out and no money needs to be spent, but get control of the deal. And that's going to require you to, you know, talk to the brokers that they'll have faith and they'll believe in you. Because, you know, a year ago when I, a year and a half ago, when I first got started, um, in the multifamily space, I had a lot of experience in real estate, but just getting started here, it was very hard to get brokers to even give me any time, right? Uh, let alone send me any good deals. Like we can all go online and sign on to one of those newsletters and start getting deals that's sent to us in the, in the emails. Great, sure. But you want to be on a like first name basis with the broker with the brokers that are in your area or whatever market you're looking at. So 
I would say that's the first step is to go into getting on a first name basis with brokers, right? You have to make an impression. They'll be able to tell very quickly how, how, how full of shit you are, I guess, <laughs> or how legit you are, let's say. And how do you do it if you're new? Right? Cause it's, it's hard. And I would, and, and what I would say is get, confident when, when you have confidence they'll give you a shot but confidence is going to come from knowledge confidence is going to come from who's going to be holding my hand through this deal if you have no idea what the process of closing looks like you're not going to be able to speak with a broker with confidence all right so that's that, that's why these calls are so important because you leverage what someone else already has done Right. And maybe it may be different from and, and the reason why I'm doing these calls is because, you know, guys like Grant Cardone, they're they're really big. The process in which they go and take down a deal and what they say to brokers on the phone, it's not going to be what you're going to say on the phone. You might be able to grab some, you know, knowledge from what he's sharing on a high level, but he can back all those things up. And so I, I kind of heard an advice that I don't particularly agree with, which is just start submitting LOIs all or as much as you can, two or three a day or a week. You know, I hear so many people are just submitting LOIs every day, every week. If you submit an LOI and the broker finds out that you're full of shit, it makes it look worse. Now you have a harder hill to climb. Right. This is why I always say, man, find a team, find somebody that you can work with that can help you through the process. You can leverage their track record. When I first got started, I had to leverage other people's track record. I leverage, of course, what I can about myself that I've been in real estate this long. I've raised, you know, five million dollars for deals. And those were all on the single family side. But when it comes down to the multifamily side, I had to leverage someone else's deals. Yeah, we've done deals here. We've done deals there. We've got deals. They're not mine, but I had to leverage it. And this is why you want to find your tribe. You want to find your team. Find someone that you can work with that's really going to have your back. Then you have to ask, what's it going to take to do that? So I wouldn't just blindly submit LOIs, you know, just to kind of waste people's times. Right. It's like, OK, yeah, you got something out of it, but you wasted the broker's time. So we always, always want to operate win wins. That means we respect people's time. The broker's got to if he goes and takes your offer, presents it to the seller, then they have a conversation about you and then you're full of shit. That just is a waste of his time and it makes you look worse. So I would, I would kind of, you know, figure that out on your own, how you want to do it. If it's just about getting some training yourself and, and submitting LOIs, you know, uh, maybe, maybe do it, maybe not. You just use your own kind of critical, logical thinking about that, right? In, in business and in all areas of, of, of our lives, you know, we want to try to create win-wins. That means we won't, waste other people's time either we don't want our time to be wasted why we want to waste other people's time All right so that's 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 my thinking that's my kind of like challenge this week when i when i when i heard it you know i'm on i'm on i'm in grant cardone's real estate club i know some maybe a couple of you guys here are also and um you know great gr listen awesome club i wouldn't be where i am without that club but there are things that I personally don't agree with, especially for brand new people, right? I was brand new. So I know the mistakes that I had to make and it, would, and it looks stupid. So don't look stupid. Once one broker finds out you're full of shit, trust me, all the brokers will. They all talk amongst each other. It's crazy. When you're in the, when you've done a couple deals and you're, and you're kind of in it, you'll see these brokers all, all talk to each other. So yeah, and then it goes from uh, the LOI to something called a PSA, which is the contract. And the contract's gonna basically lay out, now we're obligated. How much are you gonna have to put down? 
Normally, what you would put down is 1% of the purchase price. Okay, now certain deals, when they have been really good, I've put down much more than 1%. I've even gone hard day one because, you know, not everything is black and white. Like not everything works just on 1%. You, you may, because the deal is great, you may want to incentivize just to get it, right? It's not always about trying to, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, well, if it doesn't work, move on to the next one. Yeah, but if you love a deal and you know in your heart, like my, my first gauge is that I trust my own personal instincts because of how much, you know, how much I've been around real estate too. And I think every one of us here also has that instinct. When you see something good and you see something nice and you see something great, there's a part of you, there's something that happens that you're like, oh yeah, I love it. You know, but you know, our own stories and stuff like that gets in the way and we don't do it or something like that. So yeah, then we go into the PSA. Of course, um, then the due diligence process happens. You know, I just want to kind of lay out on a high level the sequence of how it works. And then we'll we'll go into some Q&A. We'll underwrite some deals. And, um, you know, hopefully that we can create value for everybody that's here because it's important. You guys took your time out to be on this call. I want to deliver as much value as I can. And, um, yeah, so let's see. Then you go through the due diligence process. You got a capital raise. This is This is really important. Capital raising should be happening all the time. And capital raising looks like, first, I got to put in my mind, and this is something that, you know, Vina Jetty really landed um, on the last time I, I was around her. She was like, look, everybody is either an investor or is going to be an investor or knows somebody that's an investor. That means every single person you could be talking to and prospecting as your possible investor. And I had a conversation today with um, someone on the plane that was next to me. And he's very passionate about uh, helping poor communities. And so he's like, if everybody just got life insurance, there would be less crime. I was like, wow, that's an interesting um, concept. You know, he's like, hey, if, 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 if my parents or if my family had life insurance and my dad passed, like, I wouldn't even have as much debt as I would be in right now. Our family would be much better off. He's like, with one life insurance, you can literally cut the cords of these generational curses that they believe they live in. I'm like, whoa, that's a really interesting idea. But they don't, you know, I, I think when people have a vehicle that they believe they can make money with, and they realize that people are the, the, the key and the answers to it, Everyone will work harder. And when everyone sees everyone as a potential prospect, as a potential client, like we will treat the world like we will treat other people nicer. I feel like, you know, maybe there will be some overcoming of like inauthenticities that that may show up. But at least everyone's going to be like, oh, well, this is a possible prospect. I'm not going to treat them like shit All right, or treat her like shit. So that that was kind of something that just interrupted my thought as I as I was sharing. So tangents, my bad. Um, yeah, capital raising. Ask everybody. You know, you want to create engaging posts on social media, engaging posts on um, you know LinkedIn, wherever you can to start. And what I mean, what I mean by engaging is. You're not just telling information. You want people to engage the information. So for example, it would be like, what does everybody think about multifamily investing? What does the, everyone think about, you know, stocks versus multifamily? What's everyone think about the Las Vegas market? Right? What's everyone think about these things? So you're, you're, you're kind of looking for people who are going to engage, engage you. One, you're going to find either people that really support you, which is important in our success. You're going to find the people that are going to be super negative, which when you're first starting off, you really don't want to deal with those people, right? You kind of want to focus on all the things that's going to help you be successful. Just ignore all the naysayers and the negatives. 
And then you'll also find who's got money and who's got knowledge. You want to find in your own network, who are my resources? Because we all have way more than we think. You know, when we go through capital raising, we take our phones, okay? We look through names and we're like, yep, no, yep, no, yep, no. We're really like, we're telling ourselves who's an investor and who is, who's not. And I've learned that, you know, if you guys can take something away from this is that if the people that will invest easiest with you sometimes are people that are least expected. Somebody that you haven't talked to in five years, 10 years. And they're like, next day, like, here you go. All right, because they want to be in. And then there are people that you think would have had your back and would invest all the money and they never invest. So consider everybody as potentials. Now, capital raising, the purpose of capital raising is on the surface, it is to raise money for the deal. But below, beneath that and beyond that is your opportunity to deepen relationships and also be able to look at yourself and how you do relationships. Because each person that says no or yes, you can look a little bit deeper to see how you've been doing relationships, what's working, what's not working, and what do you get to add for a future, you know, for, for how you're going to do relationships with people. You know, so capital raising, extremely important. And then, you know, you want to have the money in the bank. You know, these lenders are usually going to ask between two, three to four weeks before closing. So if you go for a deal and you got 60 days due diligence, 30 days closing, 30 days extension, that's a lot of days, right? That's, that's 120 days. That's four months you're asking them to, to have you in contract for. So, and then you got 60 days to be able to pull that out with no repercussions at all with your earnest money. Earnest money is the money that you have to put down to get the deal on their contract. Like I said earlier, 1%. And then, um, yeah, and then you close the deal. Then it's operations time. Then, then the work really begins. So this is not all easy, okay? So, you know, I see, I see a lot of times that new people get together and try to get deals done. Like, don't do it that way. You definitely 100% want to piggyback off of somebody that's already doing deals. Figure out how you can be in it. Anyway, I raised 90% of the money on, my fir on the first deal I joined. And I literally asked for like, I, I took whatever percentage was, was offered me. I didn't care about that because I wanted the experience in the deal. And I was in that deal as a passive GP. I raised capital for it. You know, I do some asset, I do some investor relations for it, but I don't run the operations, but I got to watch it. I got to be on the operations calls. I got to be on the calls with the property managers and allow me to learn so much. And about, I did five deals like that before I did my own deal. So before I actually thought I was capable of running a deal. And so we closed the first deal that I, I, I you know, basically am in charge of, really the, the lead sponsor on the deal. And, you know, a lot of learning lessons too. As much as I've learned, as many masterminds as I've been in, you know, a student of all of this, there was still so many areas in which, man, if somebody else, that, you know, if I just had somebody that was all in storage and have been in it, became my mentor here, some things could have been saved. There could, there's definitely things that we could have saved money on and done better and all that if we just had it, if we had the right people in place, right? So it's always about finding the right people in place on your team. Most importantly is who's going to help raise the capital and then who's got the experience already. You never want a bunch of new people to do it together. So it took me five deals before I had the confidence to do it myself. I've ran Airbnbs, short-term rentals, long, long rentals, new construction, um, all sorts of different things, lease options in the residential space. But multifamily is a whole nother beast. 
because you're working with property management companies. Okay, so we, we've got, um, we work with Collier's in Savannah, Georgia. We work with MMG in Macon, Georgia. We work with All Board in, um, in Florida. And now we're working with, uh, we're probably gonna be working with the company called Pure Management for La in Las Vegas. You know, going through the management companies, like there's a whole, that's a whole process in itself. What questions do you ask? How do you get the lenders to approve them? Like there's so much stuff that goes in here. And, you know, we'll in the moment here, take some questions to see where, what the direction this call should be going to. But there is a, so much, there is no way that you want to be doing everything on a deal. We have to begin to shift our mindset to be like, all right, how do I do less? Okay, how do I do less? And one of my models is how do I do more by doing less? <laughs> how do I do more by doing less? How do I become wealthier by doing less? How do I build a, a higher net worth by doing less? It's a, it's a good question, but that isn't what we were programmed to do. What we were programmed to do is how do I get more by doing more? That's the, you know, and, and all of that comes from scale. You got to be able to scale. Scaling means I have to be able to earn more by doing less, by delegating more. I will have a smaller share, but I can scale it out. And if everybody can eat on a deal, you will be able to scale. If everyone wins, one of the things we say in the legends is, is if everyone wins, success takes care of itself. Abundance takes care of itself. All right, so, you know, really cool. I mean, really, really, um, you know, I, 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 again, a lot of new people here. So I wanted to just kind of lay that whole thing out. I love multifamily. I love real estate. I think, um, you know, if people understood this game fully, there is no other games to play. All right. Like you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be in stocks. You wouldn't be in crypto. You maybe you would start your business, but please do it, you know, out of passion, not out of chasing money. Um, but from a tax standpoint, like this is the game to play. Um, I'll pause here for a second. Anybody want to share anything, ask anything? Just hit the um, the the reaction button with a raise hand, and then we'll call on you. I am also in a hotel room. I'm in a hotel bathroom, actually, because it's freaking so dark in the hotel. But I am not in my normal, you know, cool studio setup. So I got my background, my Legends background going, repping Legends. It isn't creepy, Andrea. Stop it. Bathrooms are great. You know how many great ideas I've had in bathrooms? <laughs> uh, who's a Zoom user? Oh, Tara. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Torin Elias oh. from South Florida. Hey. Yeah, I had um, a deal that I pitched, and um, it makes it doesn't really make sense um at the price that the seller wants and i want to keep in relationship with the uh the broker so i'm just wondering around that like what how do i keep a relationship but now that we went to the process of uh um touring the deal and a lot of phone calls and um how would i tell them that i'm not interested and or can i put in a loi that's kind of uh under his ballpark in a way okay so first you know i saw the deal that you pitched on grant's call i think you know you did a good job and but if i was a broker and i heard the way you spoke about it and i heard some of the things i would immediately know that you're extremely new in this in this business you mm -hmm. know so brokers know that's the first thing so i think you know being real is always going to be your your you know the the best choice i think being real which is yeah. i would say hey i'm in i'm a part of grant cardone's like exclusive mastermind and i was showing him this deal i wanted him to help me with 
you know, what I can do to take this deal down and create solutions. And, um, you know, I think, A, I was under the impression that the seller had no um, debt. Mm -hmm. But when we looked it up, the seller had, you know, what was it, 20, 18 million dollars in debt, 17 million? Uh, 17.5. Yeah, yeah, 17 and a half million dollars in debt. Now, I don't know if I can make it work. At 28 million dollars, you know, you can get me debt. You said five and a half percent. Yep. Yeah. So just for context for everybody, he pitched a deal. It's 28 million dollars. It's in Tampa. How many units is it? 154. It's actually in Sunrise, Florida. Okay, in Sunrise. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So 154 units, 28 million dollars, right? So there are a couple of ways you can go about this, but this is how you're going to let the broker know it doesn't work for you. First of all, 28 million dollars divided by 158 units. Yeah, 154. Sorry. Okay. 28 million divided by 154. That's 181 thousand dollars a door. Right. And uh, what were the average square footage on those on those deals? It was uh, 530. OK, 530. So divided by 530. So you're you're looking at these units at three hundred forty three dollars a square foot. That's how much the deal. That's how much this this deal costs you. Right. So you got to There are a couple of things you can look at. Hey, what's the replacement cost? Right. Somebody to build that new building will, I don't know, depending on, is it a class A? What type of, what class is it? Class B. Class B. So $343 a square foot. Roberto, how much can you build a brand new 158 unit uh, building for? Hell a lot less than that. <laughs> a hell a lot less than that. So now you got replacement costs. Could be it, it could be a brand new building can come up for much less than $28 million, exactly. 154 units. Right. So, you know, this is this is why you want you want to have these. I know exactly who to go to if I'm going to ask how much you're going to pay for this. How much is a replacement cost? That's one thing that you can say to the broker, right? You want to give the broker, let the broker know, hey, I did my homework, right? Even though you might be able to tell I'm newer, but I did my homework. I have I have places where I get information. Right. So now you tell the broker, you know, like the at 28 million just really doesn't work out because of A, B, C, D, all of these things. Look, a rep, if we build a brand new building, it would be less than that. Now, the other thing you want to ask, you know, and, and I don't know if you, you're writing this down, but this is recorded. So you can go back to this section. Mm -hmm. You want to find out, can I even can we even build the new things there? Right. So before you drop the hey, new new building will cost less. But is it even possible to build something new there, right? Like wherever it is, maybe it is, maybe it's not. If there, if it is, then you're like, dude, somebody's gonna build a brand new building for less than me, and it's gonna crush me. That's that's number one. Two, I would look at, um, you know, I would start to pull out the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. The numbers would be, um, so you said, how much is the gross income? You said, gross income two point two, two point two million. Mm -hmm. uh, divided by um, 154 units. So that's 14,285 a year divided by 12 months. So you, what you're looking at like $1,200 a month for uh, average rents over there? 1,200, uh, it was 14. Okay, well, based on 2.2 million, well, I guess if you take some, uh, you know, vacancy rates on there, you're probably somewhere around 13. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are they, you know, you look at those to see like how what's the comps in the area? You know, like is this something that you can increase the rents to? And if it can, fine, that makes sense. So you have 2.2 million, and you said the expenses are how much percentage? Um, the NOI would be 1.3, so it's around 43 percent. That's under eight. Okay, 45. so in Florida, in Florida, you would want to do the underwriting here at 50 percent. Mm. Okay, especially once you get into this and you get by this property, I promise you, taxes will go up drastically and insurance will go up drastically for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are things to know. So you would underwrite it at 50%. So even though they said it's 1.1 million NOI, 
you would say, look, I got my own numbers here. And if you have a $2.2 million uh, gross, I, I am only comfortable writing it at 1.1 million NOI. Okay. Okay. I'll take half, you know, 50%. So yeah, honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I kind of understand what you're saying, and I think the broker now would actually understand um, that. You know, he'd understand that I did my homework, and he'd look at the deal himself. I think he was he's pretty smart, and the way that he marketed it, I think he's pretty sharp. So if I let him know that I'm not interested, and I give him the reasons, I think now he would actually you would get more respect. You see, that's that's the better approach. See, I didn't want to just give you the answer. The better approach is to do that than just going with some low ball and like LOI. Like, don't just do things without thinking, you know? Yeah. I know Grant was like, just write it up, send it in. I was like, I'm like, don't do that. Yeah. And that's just my opinion, okay? But I'm not a very far ahead of you. I would say, you know, you can catch up to where I am in a year and a half less if you really became a student of this game and, and about partnerships and how do you, you know, if you're willing to do what it takes every day, you can get there. You know, people have gotten to more units than me in a shorter period of time. And those are the people you want to be looking, looking for, right? Like who's doing it fast? How did you do it fast? How did you get into it fast? Either they had a mo- lot of money to start first, or they're just really good at, community building capital raising something but you got to find your gifts like we always talk about in like what's your superpowers right you got to discover that as fast as you can so you can leverage it let every team know this is my superpower you know and one of the greatest if you don't know what your superpower is one of the greatest ways to find your superpower is just like i'm a bridge i'm a bridger bridger of people (laughs) Mm-hmm. How about submitting the LOI for what you truly think it's worth and tell him why I break it down? So yeah, you can. But the problem is, this is about being real. If you could execute that LOI, like let's say they came back and they said, okay, deal. Now you're like, oh shit. I just submitted it for practice. But they gave me the deal and it's a low offer. And, it, and it's like, I just threw a number and they said deal. Now what? Mm-hmm. Right then? That's why you want to have all of that laid out. It's not just about finding the deal and, and here we go, just wing everything. It's just like truly being real. This is why I don't think we can make it work. You know, mm-hmm. if you can be more realistic with me in, in the future, or if you can really, you know, get the numbers down to this number, like instead of just submitting an LOI for $21 million, hey, listen, if the seller, I don't want to, I don't want to see this is about respect, right? I don't want to disrespect the seller or waste your time. So if he's willing to come to like 21, I believe I can get you, you know, we can, we can close this deal. You know, I'm in Grant's club and he told me if we get it to 21 million, he'll come in with cash tomorrow. Yep. Because that's what he said. So you could be real because you'd be like, dude, Grant said that. And if you can ex, you can deliver that. Now you're all of a sudden the hero on both sides, right? You're like, dude, Grant, 300 people heard you say, if I can get this down to 21 million, you're writing a check tomorrow. <laughs> so I brought that up to the broker and he, he said they won't fly with it. So yeah, I mean, dude, uh, the reason why they won't fly with it is because how many people, well, yeah. everyone knows Grant can't execute and close, but there is way too many people out there now dropping Grant Cardone's name because of his mastermind. And, and brokers also don't want to hear anymore, right? They don't want to hear it that you use it to leverage being able to do, get a deal, like get information. But you can say, look, this is where I'm learning from. Like, that's real. You know, mm-hmm. don't, don't go and just be like, yeah, Grant's going to come and do the deal with me when he didn't say so. But he actually said so. Be like, hey, get me the 20, get me the, get, if you can get it to 21 million, I'll get this deal closed for you. Yeah. Right, so, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll let him know. I'll let the broker know that uh, why well, I can't do it, but I can do it at that number. And yeah. I guess that would be the end of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Start, start to prepare your team. Like who's going to be your power team? And I'm not just talking about who's going to be on your GP team. Yes, find that. But also find out who's going to be the CPA you're going to be using. 
who's going to be the attorney that you're going to be using, have title company ready, you know, so you're more professional. You got a team with you that's ready to execute with you. You know, most of the times they're going to say, hey, we want to use our title company. Okay, fine. But I got one if you need, right? It just makes you look more like you're ready. Mm -hmm. So you always want, it's always about instilling confidence. And the more confidence you can show, you will instill confidence in the brokers. All right. So yeah, appreciate you being here and, uh, you know, great job on presenting that deal. I think it takes great courage to be able to come into a club and not know what's going on and just go and pitch a deal. All right. Like you, it's the, the learning from what you got out of that. One day you'll look back and be like, wow, that's, that was tremendous, you know? So kudos. Good job. Thank you. Uh, Donna. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Um, are you able to answer a couple of questions about Ogden right now? Yeah. So I guess, okay, context. Ogden is a 30-unit Las Vegas deal that we have under contract. And uh, we are actually going to do a Zoom webinar next Wednesday on it. And um, yeah, if you want to ask a question about it, feel free to do so. Yeah, I'm trying to find the right slide. But anyway, um, so there was a slide about the valuation um, mm -hmm. where you talk about rubs and then you talk about 400. What it's worth in the valuation? Yeah, the slide with the valuation. Yeah. Where did it go? It's uh, probably the, the fourth slide or something like that. Okay, so anyway, can you ask um, me how I got to that number? Yes. How did okay, you get cool. to a value of 540K? Yeah. Okay, great. So, for anybody that is new, in order to find out the value of properties, so there is residential, commercial real estate. Residential real estate is basically what John down the street sold his three bedroom house for that is newly renovated versus my three bedroom, newly renovated, everything similar. We can say that we're about the same price. That's my comp. In commercial real estate, it's how much money can you generate on the deal? What is your NOI, net operating income? That is your gross income minus your expenses going to give you your net operating income. How much is that number at? All right. So for example, on the Ogden deal, the way that I got to that number is, you know, I just, I just know that every dollar that we can save or that we earn on the NOI, if we increase rents by a dollar or we lower expense by a dollar, that gives the NOI $1. Every dollar is equivalent to about $16. And the way that I got to that is value equals NOI divided by cap rate. Okay, so if you're, let's go back for a second to Torrin's deal. $1.1 million is the NOI, right? Actually, they said 1.3, let's just use their number. 1.3 million is the NOI. The value is $28 million. That's how much they want for it. So what is the cap rate? You would take the 1.3 million divided by 28 million. The cap rate for that deal is 4.6%. Now, what happens if you increase the NOI by on that deal? Uh, like, like, let's just say it's $30,000. You can increase the NOI by $30,000 what does that mean to the value? So remember, value equals NOI divided by cap rate. We got the cap rate now, it's 4.6 and NOI above that. So we take the $30,000 divided by the 4.6 cap, which cap rate is a percentage. So in the calculator is 0 0.046. So I didn't go that conservative on our number. The, the lower the cap rate you go, the higher the value is going to be. So according to that deal that Torrin has, if he increased the rents by, or the NOI by $30,000, he would have gained $652,000 in value on the deal. Okay, because you take 30,000 divided by 4.6%, you got the new value right there. Okay, so what is 652,000 um, divided by 30,000? So every dollar you increase on his property, because it's a 4.6 cap, right, is equivalent to $21.7 of evaluation. 
every mm -hmm. dollar that you increase. So when I start to think about my life in that way as well, I'm like, every dollar equals $16. When I go and buy something, it's really 16 times that. And I'm like, ooh, hmm, do I really want to buy this thing? And then when you look at all of your deals before you spend money on things, also think about that. It's time 16, right? Like, can you generate every dollar extra? You generate 16 more dollars. Every dollar that you add to the expense line is minus $16. This is a good way to practice and train your brain as you're working in the operations, right? And $16 is conservative. Like that deal right there is $22. All right, so that's how I got, like in, in our deal, we can charge back the utilities, which is $30,000 a year. Because this, when you find someone, when you find a property that is paying for all the utilities and everything, it's like finding gold. Literally finding gold because you can charge that back to the tenants. Nobody is, nobody, no tenants like across the country now expects their utilities to be paid. Okay, so you can now charge these things back to the tenants. That would also, that would only be an extra, uh, like, I don't know, $60 or $50 for each one of our units per month. And no, sorry. It's like 70, 70 something dollars. So yeah, you're going to pay the 70 something dollars a month for the utilities, water, sewage, garbage, internet, all that stuff. And they're going to be like, all right, fine. And then you charge, you take that from your expense line and you also add it to the income line. That is directly adding $30,000 to your net operating income. By doing nothing, we don't raise rents, we don't do anything, we just go and do that. And we've just have increased the evaluation of our building by 540,000. And that's a conservative number. Now, if we raised $2.8 million on that deal, we just made a whole chunk of money just by charging back utilities. And then it just so happens on our deal, we're also $250 below market rents. You know, as I'm looking now, they're actually even higher. The class A building across from us is starting their studios at like 1275. And it goes to like 13 something. So, you know, Vegas is going to continue to increase in rents because all these people are moving into it. All right, we'll talk about market analysis another day, but I'll keep it. I think the theme here is we're keeping on like just understanding numbers and things like that right now. That would be, you know, understanding the formula. So just to kind of, recap that for everybody value equals noi divided by cap rate okay so v equals noi divided by cap if you can find any of two of those numbers you can find the third one sometimes you're going to have to add the rents up right so for 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 torrent's deal i would take 154 units times 1400 dollars average per per unit and I would multiply that by 90% occupancy, 0.9. That's $194,000 a month. That's the income on that property. So we want to take it into the year, multiply by 12. 2.328 million is what technically the gross should be, but their gross is 2.2. So there's some other stuff happening that it, there's another $100,000 that should be there that's not there so then you want to look into the delinquencies you want to look into why it's missing a hundred thousand dollars if your average rent is 1400 and we did it at 90 percent occupancy if you're telling me this is 95 percent occupancy we have a bigger problem here then it'd be like two hundred thousand dollars missing then what's happening there all right so these are when you understand the numbers and how to quickly get to those you can underwrite deals super quick and you can find out how the broker, how much the broker is bullshit, how much the seller is BSing, right? Like Grant always says, I don't mind that they lied to me. I just want to know how far they will go. I just want to know how willing they are to lie on different things. So you want to find out, but you never want to reveal your cards and, and call them out. You'll be like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. You always want to keep that like kind of mystery, right? They don't know. Because when people are lying, they're also like, uh, 
I don't know. Maybe he knows stuff. Maybe he doesn't. They're going to be all on edge. All right. So um, it's kind of like a game. It's a, it's a cool game. It's a just like relationship type of game, negotiation game. So does that support Donna? Yep. Very much. Thank you. Great. Cool. Any other questions? The more the more the lie, the better the negotiation turns in your favor. Yeah, you just got to make sure you don't start participating in the lies yourself, right? And start like, and, and I'm not saying people blatantly lie, but part of how we've accepted lying in society is exaggeration or omission. These are two ways that society kind of are like, ah, it's not really a lie, right? Like, so... We just want we just want to make sure that we don't participate like that either. We try to be as honest and genuine as possible. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to give up all your information knowing everything. How to interpret the relationship of value, NOI, CAP, or DSCR? Okay, good question. DSCR is debt service coverage ratio. Okay, really what that means is how banks determine if your deal is good enough for them to fund you. When the markets are good and things are doing well and you have experience, they may say, hey, we need your debt service coverage ratio to be 1.2, maybe 1.25. That means your NOI to your debt, okay, NOI divided by debt, has to be at least 1.25. Your net operating income, you should be able to generate 25% or keep 25% as cash flow, okay, over the debt. And that's how the banks are going to determine this is a safe property for them to give you a loan on. Okay, oftentimes, when we don't meet that, when the NOI is not high enough, what you need to do to cover the DSCR is to raise more money. You raise more money so you get less debt and so your debt cost is lower compared to the NOI. And then now you can get the 1.25. Now, if you got a deal that's just killer and your NOI is extremely high, you may be able to get away with putting 25% down. You know, even 20% down. Actually, I've seen the deals that I was looking at. They're kind of in trouble right now. They put 10, they put 11% down on a 195 unit deal. I don't know when they got this loan. But according to, you know, the records, they put 11% down for a, how much do we offer? We offer 30.5 million. So for like a $33 million deal. And uh, that's called being over leveraged, right? Especially if, they're, if their debt is um, like adjustable and, and, you know, kind of, floating that's going to be a huge problem for them so i think they might be in trouble and that's why they're selling right now um the property can support 70 percent debt at 25 million uh, we'll take a look at that here let's let's look at that this might be able to help us answer all the questions too so if you ask for 25 million okay I'm going to do 25 million and you're going to get 70% LTV. This is very, um, let's just see if we can even make it happen. 25 million times 0.7 is you're going to get debt of 17,500,000. Okay. So you got to raise seven and a half million just to close this deal, but they'll give you 17.5. Let's just say they will. And you said they're going to give it to you at five and a half percent. Right. So. You multiply that number by five and a half percent, which is 0 0.055. That's a representation of five and a half percent. Your cost is going to be for your debt, interest only debt, which probably they're not going to give you interest only like forever. So that's 962,000. Okay, to be safe, you want to underwrite it at 17.5 million. 
multiply by 5.5% interest only, and you add somewhere between 1.2 to 1.5% just for the principal part of it. So what is that? That's 6.7% for your debt. So times 0 0.067. All right, now you're at 1.172 million is your debt. All right, so remember, the NOI he said was 1.3 million. Your debt right now is going to cost you about 1.17 million. So what is 1.3 million? That's your NOI. Divided by 1.17 million, which is the cost of your debt. Your DSCR is 1.11. So that doesn't meet the 1.2. Okay, if anybody is not following along, this is a good time to ask questions so that you can write the right numbers and write formula down. What is the NOI DA DSCR ratio for 25 ROI to the LP? Not really sure what that means. Um, 25% cash, cash on cash over your, I guess, 25% of the NOI has to 25% return to the LPs. Yeah, that's probably 25% uh, <laughs> who's. I don't know what kind of deal is going to be returning that in terms of cash flow. If somebody offered that, I probably wouldn't even believe it. So, you know, I would think somebody's going to steal my money at that point. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So if it's just, okay, let's just say you got just IO payment for five years, but see, you're still going to get into trouble when the principal kicks in. That's why you always want to underwrite it with the IO plus the others. So let's take 1.3 million divided by just the 5.5% interest only. That's 962,500. So that gives you a 1.35 DSCR. And now the bank might say yes, but since you're new and the condition of the market today, um, they're going to say 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.6 DSCR. That's how they'll be comfortable, right? And your debt that you're looking for a five and a half is probably going to be some sort of agency debt. Agency debt is long-term fixed debt. In uh, commercial real estate, long-term is seven to 10 years. That means now you're going to have to write like you're going to tell your, your, your investors, this is what I think we're going to do, right? You can't do some early refinance on this probably, probably not for five years. So you're going to have to sell at a certain year, but long-term fixed debt has prepayment penalties. And I think I mentioned this this last week, but when interest rates are low, you want to get, um, you want to get a, Yield maintenance prepayment penalty, which means if the bank, okay, can sell your loan and make more money on your loan, your prepayment penalty will be less. Now, when interest rates are high, like today is, you don't want yield maintenance because when you go to refinance, it's probably going to be at a lower interest rate and the banks will lose money by selling your loan. So they're going to charge you more money. That's yield maintenance. There's another one called step down. Okay, step down is when the interest rates are high and they're going to go low and you want to refinance, but the step down goes first year, it's 5%, second year is 4%, third year is 3%, 2%, 1%, 0 All right, now I like the step downs no matter what because I feel like I can negotiate with the banks better. The lenders, I'll say, can we get a three year step down? Okay, so one of our deals, we negotiated a three-year step down. Okay, first year being 5%, and then we stepped down to zero, um, to, to one. And then um, we said that if we refinance with the bank, with the same bank, and we refinance with them, we will have no prepayment penalty. So, like, that's our agreement. You know, and they'll take that because what you're going to do is you're going to refinance with the same bank for a higher amount of money for a bigger loan, and that's new business for banks and they like that. 
it gives them another plus in their in their little calculator for their portfolio thing. And it allows them to meet the the um what is that? What word am I looking for? The um wow. Anyways, they get audited based on the types of loans and their assets and liabilities and all of that. We can we can talk about loans and how banks operate all day. I don't really want to do that. But um, understanding that is also a piece of the puzzle. Like what banks do with their money, right? They take, they, they are over leveraged. Banks are always over leveraged. It's crazy. They don't let us be over leveraged, but they over leverage like crazy. And then they put it into these, the treasury bonds. Okay, when interest rates go down, okay, treasury bonds uh, also go down. Oh, uh, wait, no. When, when interest rates go up, people will invest into treasury bonds. So bonds prices go up as well. And their old bonds become less valuable. Okay, so like Silicon Valley, they bought, you know, I think they had like $200 billion in bonds, which is great. You know, it's, it's very, very, it's as safe as it gets. But when interest rates took such a big hike, bond prices also went up because now bonds are more attractive to buy because money is harder to do anything with around, right? So then they then the bonds that they held before at a lower interest rate, they had to sell it because people were coming to the bank to get money. Like too many people did a run on the bank. They had to sell all these bonds really at a loss. And so they could only take so much losses before they finally just have to give it up. All right, so that's kind of like just a quick what banks do and to understand what banks do you understand why they'll give you loans and why they actually like giving loans to you in uh in commercial real estate all right so i kind of tangent off of that example um that's that's with rents at 14 market rents are at 16 but yes i agree you must be conservative yeah, you know, be conservative where conservative is required, but also be realistic. You know, oftentimes people get so conservative and they destroy their own good deals. You know, as many people, how everyone underwrote their deals last year, the projections that were given out, based on the interest rates today, I'm pretty sure a huge chunk of any profits that anybody had projected is really out the door. Right, renovations being done for just quick example, Houston. They've their in their insurance has increased, you know, a hundred dollars a door. That means if they increase their rents by a hundred bucks, they're just breaking even right now. Right. And then taxes going up. So man, they thought they were going to increase two hundred dollars a door, you know, cash out refi because they got a lot of doors. And then all of a sudden, all that profits is wiped out. Now what? Now you're going to have to sit and wait. It's, what, it's, it's the best thing about real estate is sitting and waiting with it. All right. So, yeah, real estate's always going to do well, I think, if you sit around with it for five years or more. That's my experience, at least. Other questions? Who else has got some questions? Got 20, 22 minutes left that I'll hang around here. You know, I'm in this I'm in this hotel bathroom and sitting in a very uncomfortable chair. Come on, guys. Can we underwrite an example deal if possible? So what I'll do is next week, next week we won't have this call because I'll be at a mastermind in Houston. But the week after, um, we can actually underwrite a whole deal. How do you feel bringing family to be LPs in your first deal? I think your friends and family, they should be your first investors. Okay, they should. Those are going to be your, you know, first, I, I say that, you know, raising capital is a relationship game. That means you should. Whatever fucked up relationship you may have with your friends and family, this is a great opportunity. Using money to see if they'll invest with you 
will really show you where your relationship is at. Right? There are people that I have such good relationships with that I'm like, hey, I got this deal. They're like, okay, I'm in. And then like, they don't even really know what deal they're in. They're just, just straight trust. Like, do you have relationships like that? Have you cultivated your relationships that when you say jump, people will jump? Because you've deposited so much goodness into that relationship that the trust factor is so high um, that people will say yes to you right away, especially your family. You know, our family usually we're like, nope, I can't talk to my family. They always think I'm irresponsible, blah, blah, blah. Like, same thing. That's how my mom and my sister was with me. And they're my first investors. You know, they thought I was just completely irresponsible with my money all the time. So I had to fix that. I had to deepen and build the trust. Would you team up as a GP for the Florida deal? Is there a price that would interest you? Um, you know, I'm also a big, yes, we have, our team is big enough to take a look at that with you. Um, but me personally, I don't, where is that? Where is sunny side or sunny, sunny something? Sun, sun root, sun, oh, sunrise. Okay. No, you're good. West Broward. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I know where West Broward is. That, that whole area. Um, I do love Florida, man. I love Florida, but you know, the taxes and insurance in Florida are such a risk that it's it's kind of like it's hard for me to to um divert from what I'm doing, you know, 25 minutes from Fort Lauderdale. Um, yeah, I think I believe in South Florida. I do like it. All right, Hawk. Thanks for being here, bro. Hey, I got a really great cigar. I got to show you. Somebody gave it to me and I got, I want to, want you to tell me later. If it's good. How, how to judge an area location? What will be questions to look into and how to find answers to those? Um, Wow, that's a lot of questions real quick. Um, okay, so let me, I'll just stop right here. Wait, let me answer Torin's question first is, let's, let's talk about it more. You know, no promises. Like I'm willing to spend some time with you on that deal. But we have a bunch of deals in our own pipeline that is higher in priority for us, you know. And 21 million isn't a raise that we can just be like, yeah, let's just like half, put our attention to this. Like if we're going to go and raise for a $28 million deal, it needs to be like full attention on it. Okay. Cause that's at least a $9 million raise. And in today's market, it's not the easiest to just raise money. Every team is struggling across the board. Um, how to judge an area location. Okay. So there's a couple things. Right. There's a couple of things that you want to look at, and I'm actually starting a 15 day challenge, which will cover that for you to look in your market as well. Um, who's got a legends thing on right now? Nick's got the Facebook group. Join that Facebook group. That group's going to be the first to get a chance to look at the 15 day um, challenge. So you can either scan Nick's code or he'll put the link in the in the chat. Join our Facebook group that we will be doing a 15 day challenge. And, you know, how do you determine a good location, a good area? You know, some of those things are going to be um, what's the what's the population growth, the demographics of the area, um, how many employers are in this location, right? Like, who are the biggest employers? Those if you only have one huge employer, it might be a uh, that, that might be a risk that you want to look into. Um, are people moving into the city, the, the population growth, um, rent growth? What's the rent growth looking like? And then how many new units might be coming online? Are, is new units going to hurt you or, or benefit you, right? Because it's not always that when new units come online, it hurts you. Because sometimes it is just trying to chase this demand 
and it's actually going to benefit the entire area because it's in such high demand. Now, if it's already, if the if you see the population growth is low and all these units are coming online, then that might be an indicator that you don't, um, it might be something you may not want to look into. I shared last week that real estate goes in four cycles. It goes in a recession phase, and it goes through recovery, then it goes through expansion, then it goes to overbuild, hyper supply, and then it goes into recession again. And it just goes round and round it goes, but it's always going kind of like upwards. So as long as you buy and hold, you'll find the point in which you can exit each deal at a good time. It's just gonna come, it'll happen. You hold it long enough. Um, good, what, what would be questions to look into and find the answer to those? You know, I, I would, I also share this a lot, which is when you call a broker, like about an area, just seek information first and then, you know, give yourselves availability to uh, set yourself up to be able to follow up with the broker. And then ask for a referral from the broker to a property manager. Like one of the things we that I love doing is I love to like pick property management companies' brains. Like even if I'm not using them, I'm like, nope, I'm not gonna use this company. I'm like, hey, can you give me an analysis of the, the market here? Like, what do you guys think about it? Tell me about the deals that you guys do manage right now. What are some challenges that you're seeing and that you're not? Where are the, those deals located? See, that's a superpower right there. I don't really actually like doing it. I just naturally do it as I talk to people. But if you became an analyzer like that, analyzing markets, and you made phone calls and you created spreadsheets and you just like rocked out like a market because you're interviewing property management company brokers, you could be a great asset to a team. Especially if it's a team that doesn't have very many analyzer type of people. Now, if it's a whole team full of analyzing type of people, you need some like outgoing promoter type of people, right? That's going to help you help get the party started, get more people into your calls and webinars, and they're going to post all over and everyone's going to know about the deals in your team. I need to know that. All right. So you'll also need, you'll, you also want to have supporters, people who are controllers that actually get shit done, very task oriented. Those are type of the four personalities that you kind of want to put together on a deal. And we talk about that in our Legends uh, Mastermind as well. We, we really try to understand that for ourselves too. Um, do you have a rule of thumb on the maximum number of LPs to bring into a deal? For a few times, not to bring too many people in the other trying to do. Okay. So 506B allows you to have 35 non-accredited investors. Uh, 506C, these are the two different regs. Uh, 506C allows you to have unlimited. And there is a reg A that allows you to have unlimited plus no minimums. They don't need to be accredited. You can have unlimited of those. Crazy amount of work. We were looking into one, but it just seems like I don't have somebody that's willing to do that much work. And I definitely don't. Um, but more people, more potential problems. Okay, that's what I want to say. So you want to vet your investors in there. Now, you also cannot have one investor invest 25% of the total raise. If you do, and this is what we also found out on our deal, is they would need to be on the loan. They would need to sign on to the loan and they would be underwritten if they brought that much money. So like our Vegas deal, you know, a little bit ways in, we're like, okay, 400K is the max we will take from one individual, four to 450. But um, yeah, it's, it's not, the more people, obviously, the more potential for problems. But that's not to say if you just had two partners that you wouldn't have problems. All right, it's just more people, more potential, but it's how you do relationships, how you keep, how you, um, how you, how you communicate. If you consider new build costs per square foot is about 280 to 300 for B type, anything over that needs to be supreme in my opinion. 
Yeah, so it's close. You could build a new building for the price of the for that 28 million. Um, uh, Mohammed, yes. Yeah, join join the Facebook group and then we'll post all the information in there in the next week or so. Let's see. And we also talk about CRMs. Okay. CRM is extremely important in the success of this business that you're creating. Actually, in any business, you should definitely have a CRM. So in our Facebook group, we also run, um, we teach the legend CRM that we offer um, on Wednesdays every week. And it's freaking badass. It's really, really insanely badass. Unfortunately, I have reached the commercial properties there. Uh, oh, so websites, um, city dash data, I think whatever is, is one that you can look for, you know, individual cities, you can find stuff in there. Um, there's another one called justice map. I use that to find like median income of different little patches of, of things inside markets, justice map. Um, yeah, it's a quick Google search for anything that you want to find. Unfortunately, I have researched that commercial part is not like a knowledge present. You cannot generate comps. <laughs> yeah. So comps, okay. You could get CoStar. Okay. CoStar I found is the best for getting comps. Okay. So I'm thinking about grabbing CoStar, but I haven't really, you know, deals kind of just come to me now. I don't, I'm not like seeking out deals from the MLS or anything like that, or from Prexy. Like, I feel like so many people are underwriting deals. I don't need to go and do the same thing. I just need to find people that are underwriting deals and you guys can bring it to me. Okay, that's why I do these calls. How do I do less work? You guys will find that I am very consistent. My actions will be very consistent to how do I do less work? <laughs> Now, it will look like I'm doing a whole ton of work, but I'm thinking, how do I do less work? All right, cool. A um, couple more minutes here. Who else? What are some other calls out there that are going good? I want to go uh, check out some of the, uh, scope out the, the comps, I guess who I can collaborate with out there. Yeah, CoStar is a lot of money. It won't work unless you got a whole team that really, you know, if you're really underwriting a lot of deals, then you can make sense of it. Well, it's been fun. I always I enjoy talking about this. Okay, go ahead. I got a thought for you. Yeah. So at one time we're talking about <clears throat> now if every if we ran this as a as a as a corporation as one unified business, right? Everybody could, could pretty much pitch in to pay for the resources. We all could share them, right? If all of uh, if all the deals came to one table, right, under one fund then you could have different people assigned to do certain tasks, right? That will work yeah, out great if, if you had it as a corporation. About, yeah, but if you're talking about CoStar, they, anytime that you are going to have a different IP address, a different like route that like points into it, like they require you to pay more money. Right. So it's not like everyone can just use the same thing and just all log in and look at it whenever they want. There needs to be a designated person that's like, hey, submit the deals, what you that's, want. And this person will be like, all right, I will find all the information. I definitely do not want to be that person. I would like to be the person that says, hey, can you get me the information on this? And somebody do, do that. Yeah, what that, <clears throat> that's part of the point. The point is, if somebody really loves to do that job, they could be the designated person that does that research. Yeah, right? that so, does the underwriting or that does a market research. They only do all the site visits or whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you can yeah. bring out the task and specialize. That would be awesome. Yeah, I, I do want to say one that. thing is right now, like because the deals we do are not 50 million, 100 million, 
there's not really enough for people to like be retired and work in our on our team like that. Like we can't pay people a salary for what they're doing. Right. Yeah. Because these deals like, yeah, we make enough money and we can we can make money in the deals, but they're not at that level. Now, once we get to le that level, it might be so structured that we can't take on new people to do that. Now, I hope that's not the case. Right. Because most people that are doing big deals like that, very closed groups. Why would they want to take on the risk of having new people hop in? Right. That's that's the that's why it becomes like a closed thing. Like who's going to do a deal with Grant Cardone? Nobody. Grant's not going to want he's got his system already. He doesn't need to chop up the pie with you and whatever you want to do. You know, not in real estate. Right. Unless you're going to bring a, you know, 10,000 unit portfolio to him for him to be a partner on. It's going to be tough. All right, so even guys like Robert Martinez, he's doing $20 million, $50 million deals. He doesn't want no partners. So there is a new wave of multifamily being done in partnerships that encourages partnerships. Now, time will tell how all this will work out, right? Like a lot of new operators jumping on, take, running real estate, but... I think real estate is one of those things that you could just get lucky. As long as you survive, you can make money in real estate. So I think it's a, it, it's probably will be a good thing, but there will be operators like the guy that just literally ran his units to the ground, got it foreclosed and bounced out of the country. Right. So like, I, I do feel, I do feel the pain for him as well. And all the people that lost money, but that's what happens though. You know, like you want to, you want to find stepping stones. You don't want to just jump all the way to something where it could ruin you and ruin people. It's like, be responsible, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Good questions. Let's see. What else is in the chat? Yeah. When people lose money, when deals fail, it just looks bad across the whole thing for everybody, you know? investors lose confidence each one of those people that lost money you know if they're non-sophisticated investors and they know they're just like first time investing and they lost money they're going to tell 10 people now 10 people are going to have that whole stigma of real estate being risky learned a lot tonight thank you alex for coaching well yeah thank you heather thank you for being here first time attending your call and it's great Thanks for the wealth of information. Looking forward to attending future ones. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for thanks for coming. Mondays we also do a call. Those are pretty fun as well. Appreciate you being here. We will do this every Monday, every Thursday, as long as I'm not in a conference. If we are, we do send out an, uh, a text and an email saying that um, you know the call will be canceled. So Monday at seven p.m. EST. If you guys go to my um, Instagram at Alex Lovely, there's a link tree that basically you can um, register for all the different calls that I do. So the link tree in my Instagram has um, the link to register for Monday. And as soon as you register, you get a thank you email, you get um, you get reminders that it's coming, and then you also get post call the replay link, and so. Yeah. Cool. Well, welcome, both of you guys. Who else? Who else? What else? We got two minutes. Oh, wait. So, everybody, I'm going to be going to Houston for uh, Robert Martinez's. Um, um mastermind okay it's probably the only one the only person that teaches operations full-on operations two-time national apartment owner of the year has like 16 other awards for owning apartments so everybody else teaches syndications teaches whatever fun capital raising nobody teaches operations but robert does and he puts on very small uh intimate events and we end up going to his house and all of that oh yeah heather was there last time it's great like it's seriously you get to meet with there's no more than 40 people gonna be there 
The tickets are pretty pricey. They're like thirty nine hundred for regular, seventy five hundred for VIP. But man, like what you learn and like having access to Robert, like because there's only forty people, you can go and have a full blown conversation with him for fifteen minutes anytime. And um, yeah, it was it was a lot of things that we've learned. And so four of us from my from our Legends Equity group are gonna be there um and it'll be cool we'll probably host some sort of mini meetup down there when we're down there um but yeah let me know if you guys are interested in going it starts wednesday it goes wednesday to friday wait 15 16 seven. yeah wednesday thursday friday yeah three days really good down in houston this coming up week i know it's super late i just you know, I'm always like last minute. I still got to book my flight down there for Tuesday. <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody's interested in going, let me know. Also, Brad Sunrock has extended some discount tickets to his AmnetCon to me and my groups. So, you know, my whole thing every time is about, you know, when, when Grant Cardone's team or Brad Sunrock reaches out, I'm like, All right, just Whatever the case, just make sure that my people, if I'm going to, if I'm going to push it for you, I want you to make sure that the tickets that my people are buying are going to be the cheapest. And that's all I ask for. All right. So we're working something out and hopefully, uh, you know, a lot of people will come to the August AmnatCon. It's really good. Last time he had Ed Milet there and Jesse Itzler and Tom Wheelwright, like, oof, that was a pretty badass event <laughs> thanks heather on um, what stage of knowledge or units should you recommend to attend uh for B robert's thing i think any because all you really need to do see whenever i spend money on an event i'm just like i don't really care about what i learned there but i better Okay, what I learned is always the icing on top, but I better make a connection there that is worth my ticket. Okay, and last time I went, Sue J is one of my really good friends now. I met him down there. Me and Vina Jenny become, became good friends also from down there. Um, the Freedom Boys, the Freedom Chasers, you know, like I work with them and, and we, you know, we, we do a lot of things together and we also met down there um me and chris luna became really good friends down there so you know and now like you know me and robert are texting back and forth all the time so from one ticket that i went to also i am the, i'm the first mastermind student that robert has by the way i am zero zero one <laughs> um but yeah the relationships you know make sure that you cultivate a relationship that you're like Yep, this is worth the price of my ticket. And you will get to 40 freaking people down there. One person just become like, find the one person that you really connect with and that you know you can do $7,500 worth of business with. And then you've already got your tickets worth. All right. Because oftentimes what happens is people pay a certain amount of money and they're like, what am I getting? Am I getting this? Am I get what am I getting out of it? Like, yeah, that's a good question. You need to be the direct, the dictator of what you're getting out of going somewhere. All right. So that's just, um, you know, then every time you spend money, you know that you're on a mission. It's not the presenter's job to give that to you anymore. You pay it and you're on a mission. So I invite you all to come to Roberts and it would be really great. We will definitely, we will get a chance to be in his office. I think we also get to go to his house. His house is freaking super large. Like I've never seen ceilings as high for a house. It's pretty crazy. Um, yeah. All right. That's it. That's all then. Thank you guys all for coming and hanging out on a Thursday night. You all could be anywhere else in the world and you guys are here. And I appreciate that so much. Okay, I will see y'all next time, next week. Thank you, Alex. Have a good Have week. Hey, thank you.
Talk soon, brother. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. All right, all right. Thank you. Hey.